If I could get everybody to uh, recording everybody in progress. Take a seat and we'll get started. Good evening. Welcome to the June thirteenth Oceanside Planning Commission meeting. Actually, for those that are standing, your timing is actually good. If I could get everybody to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, city planner, can you do roll call, please? Yes, uh, Chairman Rosales. Present. Uh, 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 Commissioner Balma. Present. Dodds. Present. Uh, Vice Chair Morrissey. Here. Uh, Commissioner Custer. And Commissioner Simons. Here. Uh, let the record show that uh, five uh, commissioners are present and Commissioner Custer is absent. Thank you. For those of you in attendance, we have a number of items tonight under the public hearings. We are not going to be um, considering or dealing with item six, which has been continued um, until July 25th. That's the item related to Ocean Camp. So again, item six is continued until July 25th. Uh, moving on then, uh, communications on matters not on tonight's agenda. Do we have any slips from the audience to speak on, again, items not on tonight's agenda? We do not, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. So we'll move to approval of minutes from our last meeting, which was May 23rd. Any discussion from commissioners? Seeing none, I'll look for a motion for approval of those minutes. I motion that we approve the minutes from last planning commission. Thank you. We have a motion to approve the May 23rd, 2022 minutes. Second. I'll second that. Second, Vice Chair Morrissey. No discussion. We'll go ahead and vote. Looks like we may be having a technical difficulty okay. here. We'll go ahead while that's being checked on with an oral uh, vote. Uh, Commissioner Dodds? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Obama? Yes. Vice Chair Morrissey? Yes. Uh, I too am a yes and Commissioner? Yes. Uh, Chairman Rosales, let the record show that the minutes are approved 5 0. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, consent calendar, we don't have anything on tonight's agenda listed. We do not have anything under transportation items, so we'll go to our first public hearing item. Hearing item number four is consideration of a tentative map development plan and two conditional use permits and a regular COSA permit for a uh, four-story mixed-use development located at 802 South Pacific Street some mixed use development. The applicant is G17 LLC. Um, I will start with disclosures. Uh, staff report. Uh, I believe we got some uh, correspondence emails um, and I drove by the location. Um, Commissioner uh, Dodds, disclosures. Um, staff reports, corresponding emails, and I did drive by the site. Thank you. Commissioner Obama? I also have the same, as well as I talked to a couple of the neighbors. Vice Chair Morrissey. I read the staff report and drove by the site. Thank you. Commissioner Simons? 
staff report and drove by the site. Great, thank you. Uh, welcome, Mr. Nightingale. It looks like you're gonna walk us through a presentation. All right. Thank you, Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, and members of the public. I'm Scott Nightingale, here from the Planning Division, present agenda item number five for the consideration of a development plan, conditional use permit, <laughs> to construct a medical office building within the Tri-City Medical Campus um, located at 4002 Scott, Vista Way. Scott, if I could interrupt you. Um, oh. I think, yeah, item four, item on four. my agenda, has the uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pacific I Street. Like, wait a I minute. have different disclosures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Add details. <laughs> we're calling an audible and we're going with. Uh, <laughs> that was a test. That was a test. <laughs> we're awake. We're yeah, trying to see if we're paying attention. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Scott. It still is agenda item number four, but it's for a tentative map development plan, two conditional use permits, and a regular coastal permit to construct a four-story mixed-use development. The four-story mixed-use development will consist of 10 condominiums, three hotel units, a subterranean parking garage, a 1,340-square-foot ground-floor commercial space located approximately 1.2 acre site at 802 South Pacific Street. Subject uh, request is for a tentative parcel map would create the one uh, airspace condo map, uh, would provide 10 airspace condominiums uh, with three hotels, a ground floor commercial, all person to article of the subdivision. And a development plan is needed for the actual construction of the building to request to the cons for the four story mixed use building uh, with everything I discussed. And one of the two conditional use permits is to actually allow the vertical mixed use project consisting of the four story, uh, 45 foot high building. Uh, a conditional use permit is required for any type of mixed use development in the coastal zone. Uh, this property is zone C1, coastal zone, so it's, it's therefore it, it's a use permit. And another conditional use permit is needed for the hotel use. Uh, per Article 4, Section 414, KK2, um, any type of uh, accommodation use, tourists, hotel, motel, requires a conditional use permit. And lastly, uh, based on the site's uh, location within the coastal zone and the appealable jurisdiction of the coastal zone, a coastal permit is needed. Here's an image of the site. It's zone C1. It's located in the southeast corner of the intersection of Wisconsin Avenue and South Pacific Street at 802 South Pacific. Uh, like I said, the zoning is C1. It's neighborhood commercial, uh, has a general plan land use designation of general commercial. Uh, and it's surrounded by primarily uh, an eclectic single family to multifamily uses in pretty much in all directions. And you do have commercial uses along Wisconsin Avenue as you, as you move east away from the ocean and towards the railroad track. Here's an image of the site. The site consists of a 10,018 square foot parcel. It's created as a part of the Myers addition back in 1885. The site is currently vacant. It's relatively flat with a slight slope towards the west. Uh, there hasn't been much development on this site since the mid 80s. Um, per historic imagery, it suggests that the site was utilized by several residential cottages that were demolished in the early 1980s. I don't know if you can make this out, but that's where the site is there in the, in the blue arrow. And there's a, it says some type of residential development. Here's an image of these first level, actually ground level, the subterranean garage. Uh, this tentative map would consist of a subterranean parking garage, 10 res residential condos, three hotels, um, all interdispersed throughout the building on this second, third, and fourth floor. Um, the ground floor will just primarily consist of the commercial restaurant, access to the garage. Um, it's actually going to be a coffee shop, which will pretty much wrap all of Wisconsin Avenue and then wrap towards South Pacific Street. Um, several right-of-way improvements will be implemented as a part of this development, such as removal of the South Pacific Street curb apron, which is located on the uh, southwestern portion of the property. That'll gain more public parking by them reconstructing the curb. 
uh, several, as you can see here, several landscape improvements. It will provide uh, several uh, street trees, low line um, shrubbery, as well as uh, landscaping. So they basically will beautify the whole perimeter of the site. Here's an image of the underground parking garage, which will provide 18 spaces uh, with five options of tandem spaces for residents and the hotel. Uh, the developer will have to submit a management plan that uh, basically lays out the parking management for the commercial uses um, if there were to be any type of valet services or, or usage of the tandem. Here's an image of the ground floor. Um, which consists of the, re the actual restaurant, as I said, like I said, it wrapping pretty much fronting all of Wisconsin Avenue, the garage access off of South Tate Street, and four condominium units. Here's an image of the second floor, which will consist of one hotel unit, uh, one condo unit, and three upper floors of those three units below. And here's an image of the third floor, which would consist of an, another hotel unit and three condominium units. All of the hotel units will be pretty much uh, located towards the rear of the property, so that uh, there won't be any uh, visitor type activity occurring on Pacific or Wisconsin. It'll, it'll just primarily be off the corner there on, on Tate. And here's the fourth level, which consists of one, one additional hotel two condos, and lastly, here's the roof, which there will be no roof access to the, um, to the residents or the hotel uh, visitors. This will be strictly only for maintenance purposes. Uh, it will consist of solar voltaic arrays, panels, and mechanical equipment. Uh, the development, like I said, consists of 10 condos. Um, five of those condos are primarily under 17, 1,750 square feet, as you can see here, uh, ranging from three to four bedrooms with three baths. Uh, they do have their own private open space balconies, as well as their own private uh, one-car garage down below. Um, and they do have bicycle parking located on the, on the, in the garage as well. Six of the 10 units will consist of 18 square, 1,800 square feet, and will be three beds, three baths, and as well have their own private balconies. Three hotel units are larger hotels, consist of 840 square feet and will be two bedrooms with one bath. And the commercial space, uh, which like I said, will primarily consist of a coffee shop, um, will be on the ground floor and three spaces will be allocated for that. Here's an image of the elevations. Uh, staffed worked with the, with the applicant on designing of more street friendly type of use here. Understanding that this is a high pedestrian, high vehicular site in the coastal zone, we wanted a use that not only provided commercial frontage along Wisconsin, but then also gave the impression that there would, there would give some, uh, some street activity on Pacific Street. And so we worked with them on wrapping it around Pacific and then having it on Wisconsin Avenue. So this project would not only enhance its surrounding through the landscaping, the architectural design, and the use of high quality materials, but will provide a little bit of activity to an underutilized site. Uh, the architecture here is a contemporary architecture design that draws from many of the newly infill developments that have been built throughout the city. Uh, this image here is uh, looking from Tate Street towards the ocean, so this is what you see from the rear. You have access to the to the underground parking garage. Um, we worked with them on providing some transparency here. So there's still some of those, those private views, which are um, not necessarily, um, we don't uh, have any regulations on private views, on blocking private views, but they still, they incorporated some uh, transparency to allow for some breakage. So there's still some of those windows that you can see through, especially down towards the ground floor, where you can have some uh, views of the ocean. And lastly, uh, with the project being um, in close proximity to the neighbor to the south, the condo complex, uh, we received a few comments during the public hearing or public community outreach meeting and regarding the bulk, the scale, and just the shadowing effect um, that this project would have on the neighbors. Um, so what they provided is they actually have an image here. I'll go to the camera. Um, we worked with them on ensuring that none of the windows would be peering into the existing windows, so there's no windows um, 
offset from one another. As you can see here, this is the existing and the proposed windows are in the, for the new development are in yellow. So as you can see, there wouldn't be any impacts. And back to the presentation here. Um, they have this living, somewhat of a living wall to type of, to break up the massing. Uh, they do have some articulations in the front. So there's some uh, elevations that you can still peek around and still see um, coastal views down towards the north. Um, and then, like I said, they're providing landscaping for some additional buffering. Reviewing this project, uh, staff reviewed the project based on the C1 zoning. Uh, this project met all development standards in, t in terms of density. Um, they're, they're required, their requirement here is one unit per 1,000. They're providing 10 units. Uh, they meet all the setbacks. Uh, they're within the height limitations there. 45 feet is the required height. They're right to the 45 foot height limit. No roof decks are proposed or any type of penthouse elevator shafts that exceed the roof. Um, they're not required to put in, provide any landscaping, but they are providing landscaping, um, 13, about almost approximately 13%, and they're overparked by approximately three spaces, and I'll go into that here. So a mixed-use residential parking requirement of one space per unit was utilized when we calculated this requirement. For section 1140Q, which permits a 25% reduction of commercial parking, um, they were able to utilize that for the commercial component. They didn't utilize that for the hotel, knowing that if there are guests, they, they, they're going to absolutely need those spaces. Um, but working with them with the 25% reduction, we felt that the, uh, the reduction made more sense to reduce the actual coffee house type use, because this use is more of a neighborhood type use. Uh, obviously, it's a zone C1 neighborhood commercial, so it fits right in with the zoning. So based on the calculations, they required three spaces for the, ho for the, uh, the commercial coffee shop. With the 25% reduction, they're at approximately two. Uh, so they're still providing those three spaces, in addition to 10 spaces plus two guest spaces for the residential, up to 12. And the hotel is one space per unit. They're providing three. So 15 spaces required, they're providing 18. They are over part. So during the uh, public community outreach process, uh, the applicant did have a Zoom meeting back in January 2022, about approximately 15 members participate in the meeting. I was also participating in the meeting. Uh, some of the, like I said earlier, a lot of participants uh, raised concerns regarding the architecture, mainly just the bulk and scale of the project. Um, they did have concerns regarding STRs. Um, this isn't a short-term rent, or a, I'm sorry, a density bonus project, so that is allowed um, in this zone, and I explained that to them. Um, they did uh, actually have praises for the architecture, so that was one, one bonus of the, of the meeting. But like I said, the major concerns were just the bulk and scale, which we tried to work, we worked with the applicant on reducing the, the bulk and scale by providing a lot of glass features. There's a lot of articulation to break up the massing, and uh, we feel that based on the current pr proposed project, um, they've, they've, they've filled their, their option to reduce the bulk. So with that, staff reviewed the project based on the following. It achieves a balance of residential commercial land uses and is consistent with the general plan. It also provides a good transition between the existing medium density, uh, the residential tourist district, which is just directly across the street, and the single family and the commercial uses within the area. Uh, the use provides visitor serving uses, such as the, the coffee shop and the hotel. Uh, the proposed project would assist in meeting the projected housing demand. Uh, the pro Project applicant will provide additional housing, the 10 units, as well as pay the in lieu fee for affordable housing. And the project does meet uh, all, all items for um, development standards. So with that, staff recommends that the Planning Commission by motion firm issuance of the CEQA exemption for infill development and adopt the resolution uh, 2022 P13 for approving the project. This concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions. Uh, the applicant's architect is here, and they'll make themselves known. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Any questions for Scott? Commissioner Baller? Yes, th thank you. Um, I just want to clarify, uh, when you brought up uh, the conditional use permit, CUP21, it's mainly just for the um, mixed use in the commercial, not so much the height. The height is already established. So I just wanted to, that's true, right? It's oh, not Commissioner Baller, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, it's only for the, the actual mixed use. Okay. 
Then the other question I was just thinking is the, is the 45 feet, I know we've had a couple of, uh, or at least one I can remember of a house on the, on the, on the ocean side that, that used the 45 foot to the ceiling. How many projects have actually, and where does this 45 actually occur on the other side of the street? I mean, is it pretty much all of the residential tourist zone? Is it just on Pacific Street? Like, where does the 45 foot height? Well, the 45 height limit would only be um, permitted for any mixed use developments along Wisconsin okay. with its own C, C1 there. Okay. Um, anything south or north or even east of this has to uh, abide by either the, I believe, the 30, 35 foot height requirement. And there's even portions on just north of this um, on Pacific Street within the zoning district for uh, it. Just north of this district of 5A. Right. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. I don't see any other questions for you at the moment. Um, I think you indicated we had the applicant's uh, representative here if they'd like to come forward and present or just ask or answer some questions. Up to you, sir. Can you give us Hi. your name for the record? Yes, Jonathan Sherman from AVRP Architects. Uh, where the design is on this project. Um, I'm just here to answer any questions. Um, Thank you. Any questions for the app? Hang on, sir. Don't leave just yet. I'm sorry. I have, I have a question for you. <laughs> Come back um, up. On the, tan on the tandem parking, can you just kind of go over that a little bit about how that will be managed? I know you said that the residential units will have the tandem parking, but they're individual people. How does that, how do you, how do you see that working as far as how do you think that's gonna fly? So it's a common thing in a lot of our projects. Okay. Um, we weren't showing it today, uh, but we have actually gone back into this design subsequently, rearranged it, so we now can actually do the same amount of parking, but this time without any tandem. So, interesting. but it's not what we're showing here today, <laughs> but it is something we can achieve. But as far as tandem parking, uh, generally it works. It works better if they, if people share a unit. Yeah. Um, again, going back to the subsequent design change that, that allowed us to do it without the tandem. Well, that sounds better. <laughs> Sound, that sounds like, it's, I mean, I know it's kind of a surprise to Scott over here, but uh, <laughs> it sounds like it, it would work better, I would think, you know, to have it not, because I couldn't figure out how you're going to do that. Okay, if you're like going to come in first and how am I going to knock on your door, can you move your yes. car? And so <laughs> no, yeah, so we, we've, we've addressed that. Okay, since then. thank you. Okay, thank you. This is a public hearing, so um, we invite the public to provide input. Um, go ahead and start reading off our slips. Mr. Chairman, we do have four slips this evening. I'm going to read your names. Just please come up in the order I read, and you will have three minutes to speak. Uh, first up will be Joan Bachman. Second, David Nasi. Third, Peter Weinberg. And fourth, Betty Ann Markard, if she chooses to speak. Hello, Commissioners. I'm Joan Bachman. I live right up the hill from this project and have watched this lot for some time. Um, so kudos. First, I'd like to start with those. The architecture is lovely, um, very neat. I'm not exactly sure how those cantilevers stand up but um, without bouncing a little bit, but I'm interested to find out. Um, I'm very happy there are no roof decks. Those are horrific for the people up the hill uh, because of noise for everyone, whether or not it's in the view. And obviously, this has always been meant to be commercial. So happy to see that. I'd also like to give them kudos for not having Mexican feather grass in the landscape. Very good. Um, last time I was here, I did speak about that. And you guys didn't mention it to the applicant. We really need to stop the planting of that. It is actually in the city planting. It uh, wasn't put there, but it is now uh, next to the cup. So it is growing everywhere and is headed to our lagoons. So please. Do not ever put that in. It's on the uh, list I've given you of the weeds. Um, secondly, tree succession. We need to get serious about this. All these palms were planted at the same time. If you look at old pictures of Oceanside, there are no palms. <laughs> they all come in at about the same time. 
At some point, we're going to find out they're old and possibly unsafe. Um, also, they do absolutely nothing for climate change. So we really need to have other types of trees. I think the other ones identified are another kind of palm. Um, so we really need actual leafy trees, uh, whether they're desert willows or what, uh, to go in there um, so that we are planting now. Because the best time to plant a palm was 40, I mean a palm. Sorry, you're never going to hear that from me. Um, <laughs> the best time to plant a tree is 40 years ago. The next best time is right now. So we really need tree succession in all of our our projects. So no feather grass and yes, tree succession. And then um, finally, I wanted to cover this. On the okay, this is parkway failure across the street. And I'm doing this now so you don't have to listen to me later. Um, we really need to reword the language in the city code that allows them to put concrete where there should have been planting. This is purely failure of imagination. If you're down on the strand looking up toward this, this lot, there's a red curb all the way up. It is concreted in. They did that a few years ago. Then the city, you see the city sign there, which means I paid for this, just putting concrete. And as I come across the sidewalk in the lower picture, that's not a sidewalk. Am I supposed to walk into the pole? Like, why isn't that planting? We have got to limit the amount of concrete we're putting in. I understand they have trouble growing things. They need to talk to me. I can grow anything anywhere. And um, on this project where they're having a living wall, I would suggest uh, mountain mahogany, um, toyon, and Pacific wax myrtle. They grow beautifully. You don't need a living wall. Thank you. Thank you. Joan? Next speaker. Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, David Nassi. I am a four-year resident of Oceanside, um, long-time resident of uh, San Diego, grew up in Pacific Beach, and Oceanside was the furthest thing from our mind to come up here during those days. Um, it's amazing what how Oceanside has blossomed. You, you, I've done Solana Beach, Del Mar. It's getting cleaner and cleaner every day. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I just think the way Pacific Street is gone and the developments that we've had there, I think this would be a wonderful addition. Not too big, not too gaudy. God knows we don't need another high rise hotel, but uh, I think this would be a great addition. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. Hello, uh, my name is Peter Weinberg. I'm a uh, local developer kind of interested in, in getting involved in Oceanside and I've been seeing, well, known about this project for a while, I've been sort of watching and tracking it and seeing what's happening. Um, I, and just my first time at a planning commission meeting here, I've just been really interested in the process in Oceanside. Um, from my perspective, I just was here really to support the project. I see it as a very responsible, environmentally friendly uh, development of an underutilized site by an award-winning architect. Um, from what I gather, hearing uh, Mr. Nightingale present, the uh, AVRP has worked collaboratively, or collaboratively with staff to address and mitigate uh, local concerns. Um, especially with bulk and scale, which I've heard as a developer before many times, whether it has to do with adding more glass to improve the view corridors, especially on the ground level. Um, the green wall that they're putting on the side, that's something that I know most developers wouldn't even consider doing or most architects wouldn't even add in because it's expensive to add something like that. As well as additional landscaping that's just going to beautify the, the neighborhood in, in general. So um, I just look at this as a, a, a great Opportunity for Oceanside, uh, very well designed, um, thoughtful development that I understand there's always differences of opinion, whether modern is too modern, but it seems like it fits and tracks with the local neighborhood. And uh, I certainly think that it would do well to uh, move forward with it, especially considering what I was reading in the staff report of uh, almost 5,500 um, projected housing shortfall over the next eight years in Oceanside. This has the potential to make a small dent in that. So. Um, 
that's it. I hope to see this get built soon. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have one more speaker. My name is Betty Ann Marquardt. I put my name down in case I had uh, some questions, and I think they were all answered today. But yeah, my family has property nearby, so I just wanted to see what was happening. Thank you. Thank you. If you didn't put a slip in, that's OK. You can still come forward. Um, give you another few seconds before we close the public hearing. I don't see anybody rushing forward. So we'll close the public hearing, bring it back to the commission for discussion. Any other questions anybody might have or a motion? Yeah, I'll, I'll move that we uh, confirm issuance of the CEQA exemptions. We approve the tentative map development plan, two conditional use permits, and a regular coastal permit by adopting planning commission resolution number 2022 P13 with findings and conditions of approval attached. Thank you. So we have a motion by Commissioner Simons to approve uh, this project. Uh, second or? Further deliberation? Or? I, I would uh, offer a uh, very enthusiastic second. I think the architecture is outstanding. Whoever, the archi if the architect's here, you did a great job. It's beautiful. And so I just uh, have to commend you for that. And working with the staff, you've achieved some great things as far as that cafe look and the, and the view quarters. And you've been very sensible to all that. Um, I have to just make a comment about the palm trees. I know Joan's very passionate about no palm trees. But in the case of this architecture and this style, Palm trees kind of, you know, the canopy trees don't really do this justice. So I don't, I don't know what the architect's going to do, but I would say keep your palette of landscape. I think you did a good job. <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much again for coming to Oceanside and, and building such a beautiful project. This is going to be a great thing for Wisconsin Street. So. Thank you, Commissioner Obama. Yeah, and I'd echo that this looks like a terrific project. I think it will fit in nicely with the neighborhood there. Uh, so we have a motion. We have a second. Uh, any other discussion? If not, let's vote. Looks. Is it working? It looks like it may not be working. Uh, oh, here we go. Here we go. It looks like we were missing one vote. I did vote. I did vote. <laughs> okay. I mean, let me. Yeah, let's do it again. Just. Hang on a second. Okay. Go ahead, everybody. Okay, Chairman Rosales, let the record show that the motion passes 5 0. Great. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the next item, item five on our agenda under public hearings is consideration of a development plan, conditional use permit to construct a 14,000 square foot psychiatric care service located uh, in the Tri-City area. The applicant is the San Diego County Health Services. Uh, we'll start with disclosures, um, familiar with that area. Uh, driven by many times, um, staff report, and then uh, we also on our dais this evening got a couple of items, um, looks like something from the applicant, and then a letter or email from a um, community member. Uh, Commissioner Dodds, your disclosures? Um, staff report, and I believe I, I met with um, some of the planners. I mean, I'm sorry, the developers. Great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Obama. Staff report, familiar with the site, and the, the, uh, on the dais, I guess, the attachments. Thank you. Vice Chair Morsi. Um, staff report, um, the emails that we received on the dais, spoke to a telephone call to the developer, and familiar with the site. Thank you. Commissioner Simons. Uh, staff report, and I did meet with the planning team. Welcome, Scott. You got the right, All right. presentation here. Yeah. <laughs> I think I got it. I was excited Go, for this one. Ahead. I wanted to show you this first. <laughs> All right. Planning commissioners, chairman, 
Members of the public, I'm Scott Nightingale, here to present agenda number five for the consideration of a development plan and a conditional use permit to construct a medical office building within the Tri-City Medical Campus at 4002 Vista Way. Uh, the applicant is the San Diego County Health Services. Uh, they're asking for a development plan to construct a single story, 14,400 square foot medical office building with associated site landscaping, parking improvements, and a new emergency access driveway located off Warren Road. If I can mention, um, earlier today we just got news that the applicant is requesting to remove the um, emergency driveway that was a part of this project off of Warring Road. Um, we looked into this, we worked with fire and traffic earlier today, and uh, this is something we can allow. Um, they would just have to extend their wrought iron fence that they already have proposed. Instead of having a driveway with a gate, it would just be a wrought iron fence with landscaping. Um, so that's what we were proposing uh, as a part of this project. Um, we can implement this as a project condition um, and, and state that they would just basically, uh, during final, they remove the driveway, uh, provide more landscaping to the satisfaction of the city planner. So that's what our motion would be, and I'll add that into the, the final motion. Uh, the conditional use permit is the introduction of the actual medical office building, which will be occupied by the psychiatric facility uh, with associated surface parking and emergency access driveway, which will now be removed. For uh, Article 11, the proposed medical office use is a permitted use within the commercial professional district and the proposed psychiatric inpatient 16-bed use associated with the medical hospital is a permitted use by right. Um, but since they're adding a new building into the Tri-City Medical Center, uh, they need a conditional use permit revision. So that's the reason for the, the CUP. Uh, here's an image of the site. Uh, it's within its own parcel, um, still part of the Tri-City Medical Center, but like I said, it's its, its own parcel. Uh, zone CP, uh, commercial professional, has a general plan uh, land use designation of prof professional commercial. Uh, like I said, medical uses are allowed by right. Uh, the nearby land uses consist of, uh, to the north, we have single family homes, uh, medical office and hospital uses to the east, which is basically the Tri-City Medical Campus, a medical office building to the south, and the Home Depot with several commercial inline tenants, and also single family residential located directly to the west. Well, here's an image of where the facility will be located. As you can see, it'll be in the northwest corner of the Tri-City Medical Center, but standalone on its own parcel. Uh, the project site consists of 3.77 acres. Uh, with the, the total Tri-City Medical site is 35.57 acres. Uh, the site exists as a newly developed 290 asphalt parking lot uh, with landscaping that was recently approved, well, not too recent, but back in 2017 under administrative development plan that was approved by the city planner. So as you can see here, with now the removal of the driveway, which it's an emergency access, it would have been an emergency access driveway only for dispatch vehicles. Um, still the existing access to the site is only through the Vista Way, uh, Tri-City Medical entrance off of Vista Way there. The proposed 14,400 psychiatric building would require the removal of 88 parkings, existing parking stalls. Um, additional parking would be replaced, uh, which would be part of this proposed development, um, which would bring us now to an inventory of 199 spaces provided for, this, for the facility. They're only required to provide approximately 88 spaces, and with the existing plus the new implemented, they'll have approximately 199. Uh, the added parking that was um, approved and constructed back in 2017 was additional parking for the facility. So they're basically over parking the Tri-City Medical Facility in hopes of additional uses that they plan on doing in several other phases, which will come forward to this body at a later time. Uh, the site is landscaped at approximately 25%, which is above the requirement of 15%. They will actually... Uh, gain more landscaping by this new change of removing the driveway and implementing um, new landscaping off that entrance emergency access off of Warring Road. And here's an image of the proposed landscaping. But like I said, on this on this uh, this area here for the new 
emergency access driveway, which will be removed. That'll be additional landscaping as well. Uh, here's an image of the internal floor plan, the typical office type medical office layout. Um, they do section off the 16 beds, which are on the, on the left section here. Um, the applicant will go further into the operations of the site. Uh, they have different um, levels of security for, for some of these individuals. Um, some of the concerns from the neighborhood um, were regarding um, some of the patients wandering off site and going into the neighborhood. That should not occur. Um, everybody will be checked in either by a medical official or by a family member and they will not be able to leave freely unless they have a chaperone or someone checks them out. Here's an image of the elevations uh, and the landscaping. The proposed landscaping architecture of this development would, would enhance the site and the surrounding through the building's uh, sitting, landscaping, architectural design, and the use of the high quality materials. Uh, as you can see here, this is the image off of Waring Road. So you would see the buildings, but a lot of it would be um, buffered by a lot of the landscaping that would be incorporated. They do provide shade canopy trees, as well as some new low-line landscaping, and uh, a new wrought iron fence, which there, are, um, there has been issues with break-ins on the chain link fence of individuals cutting through here and making an access cut, uh, shortcut between the facility and the neighborhood. Uh, that should not occur by this new um, broad iron fence. The proposed single story building height and overall scale of the proposed medical office building will be consistent with the pattern of the mid-rise uh, buildings within the Tri-City Medical Center's campus. Um, this is the proposed driveway which we are now eliminating. If um, They did have a pedestrian access which was only for emergency on oh, operations only, but like I said, that's, this will all be removed. Uh, they will, um, in the event for the construction, they will be utilizing portions of Waring Road um, like they were for the construction of the asphalt parking lot for construction purposes only. But after that, this will all be fenced off in landscape. And here's an image from the internal looking towards the west of the building from the internal. Uh, they did have a, a community outreach meeting. Um, they actually had two meetings. One on February 2nd and one on February 16th. Approximately 15 members par uh, participate in the two meetings. Public address uh, the, the concerns regarding this psychiatric patients trespassing the adjacent res uh, residential neighborhood. There was traffic concerns regarding the emergency access, which is now going to be removed. Uh, once the applicant explained that the patients are not permitted to leave the facility uh, with the and then only without a chaperone, a lot of these um, concerns were, were eliminated. So reviewing this project, uh, staff reviewed the project based on the following, uh, general land use element compliance, the proposed medical office conforms to the general plan of the city, uh, the use is a permitted use by right, uh, achieves a balance of medical office commercial land uses, uh, the proposed building would not only complement the site, but the existing neighborhood, as well as the Tri-City Medical Campus, and provides a good transition between the Tri-City Medical Campus and uses and the surrounding medical uses along Waring Road and the existing single family. And lastly, the proposed project would assist in providing the additional medical office care to the community and the county. Uh, they'll go into the need for the use. Um, apparently, um, the Tri-City Acute used to have uh, psychiatric services here, and since it's been removed and now there's a high demand for it, so kind of the need for it now. And lastly, it conforms to all elements of the uh, development standards for the CP district. But with that, staff recommends that the Planning Commission by motion confirm the CEQA exemption for infill development and adopt resolution 2022-P14 proven development plan conditional use permit for the actual construction of the 14,400 square foot psychiatric care building with the condition to remove the driveway and work with staff during the building permit stages. Uh, this concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, the Tri-City Medical Team uh, would like to make a presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Any questions? Scott? Go ahead, Commissioner Dodds. Um, first, I have two questions. The first question is that the, the, um, with the removal of the driveway, will, there, will the new landscaping be consistent with the current 
the current planning of landscape? Uh, Commissioner Dodds, yes, we will make sure that our landscape plan checker uh, reviews the landscape to ensure it not only meets the uh, the theme of the landscaping within the area that this project is proposing, but also is consistent with the landscape manual and the zoning ordinance. So, yes, that'll be that'll we'll make sure that'll happen. And second question is, it looked like that area seems to be very popular for that shortcut with the the, the cutting of the the chain link fence. Um, with the new fence design, how tall is that fence? Go for reason asking is my concern would be scaling. Sure, uh, the zoning ordinance only re allows for fences no taller than six feet. Um, in some rare instances, we do allow for eight, but that's if it's a budding residential. Unfortunately, this is not a budding. There's a removed from the street. The street's um, in between both of there, so yeah, it's maximum height is six feet, unless. Uh, yeah, that's it, six feet, sorry. <laughs> and if I can mention, I, um, I did put an email that was received in the last hour um, regarding that same, same issue, and it's on, your, on your, your desk there. Thank you, Scott. I think that's it for the moment. Thank you. Uh, you indicated the representative uh, has a presentation. If you would come up. Introduce yourself and good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Luke Bergman. I am uh, the director of behavioral health services for the County of San Diego, um, and the, the County of San Diego Health and Human Services Agency is the is the developer. Of course, I run the uh, the department um, that. Uh, um, that is the sort of steward of and payer for, for medical services uh, for people with behavioral health conditions, which includes uh, serious mental illness um, and substance use disorder. I just want to say a, a few words about um, what we call the continuum of care, the sort of landscape of behavioral health services across the county, which is really a critical context uh, for, uh, for this project. And I think... Um, points to how important it is uh, to, uh, within the county generally uh, uh, to, to, to meet the needs of, of folks and how important it is um, to this particular locality. Um, so let's see if this works. It doesn't. It does. Great. Um, so this is, uh, if you guys are, you, you can see this in front of you. Yeah, great. Um, that's fancy. Um, uh, this is just a graphic image that we use to sort of describe um, the, the kind of undergirding tenets of the work that we're engaged in right now in, in behavioral health care in, in this county. Um, for, for many, many decades, behavioral health care has been predominantly understood as a crisis service, as necessarily all about crises. Um, and that's an artifact of long-standing stigma around behavioral health, how it's paid for, um, but it's really sort of in, infused um, uh, kind of how we think about the services that we have to build in response to, to, be, uh, to behavioral health concerns. Um, and it's perpetuated in a lot of ways uh, our failure to really normalize care for people with behavioral health conditions, to make it a normal part of health care. The way that we represent that is with this inverted triangle. Um, we are heavy into crisis service development um, currently. That's true. That's been true in the county. It's true across the country and really across the world. And it reflects sort of disproportionate investment. It has long standing. What we aim to do um, is to flip what we understand as an upside down pyramid, currently right side up, uh, so that a much smaller proportion of crisis services are supported by a much more robust system of care that's really about continuous engagement instead of episodic crises, continuous normalized care that leads to longer uh, community tenure, better outcomes, better lives for people with behavioral health conditions. The way that we are aiming to, to invert that uh, pyramid is, is really kind of through three different related but discrete buckets of, of work. Um, 
One is crisis and diversionary services. We're, we're busy building out lots of new evidence-based crisis and diversionary services. Um, we are building inpatient services that reflect a new way of thinking about how it is that inpatient psychiatric services should be built, and you'll see that reflected in, um, in the, the, the service that's under discussion today, and that is not as services that people return to over and over again episodically, which is what we see with most behavioral health services. People go, they're stabilized very briefly, they're spit out, and then they return, right? We see lots of what we call recidivism in care, especially in acute psychiatric care traditionally. What we're aiming to do is establish services that are about transitions into ongoing care. So the transition into ongoing normalized or continuous care is much smoother. We see less recidivism into inpatient hospitalization. We see less crisis on the streets, predominantly among people with behavioral health conditions. The third component is to, is to establish additional residential and long-term care for people with, with uh, ongoing needs for psychiatric uh, attention. Our approach in doing this across the county is to, is to be very deliberately uh, regionally distributed, and we use that phrase a lot, that we're establishing a regionally distributed model of care. It doesn't make sense to aggregate or congregate all behavioral health care in you know, only one or two sites in the county. Um, we know that some of the most important parts of what makes people well over time people who need psychiatric uh, care, is connection to community, connection to family, connection to social networks. Um, and we can really only make that a part of people's care if we distribute care regionally so that it's close to the places where people live who will need care, close to family, close to friends and social networks. So we can't just do this in one place or one or two places. We've got to really distribute it regionally. And you, you see in this slide, um, some of what we have been working on over the last few years, I've been in this, in this position for about uh, three years, um, that reflects this emphasis on, on regional distribution and also reflects an emphasis on the sort of, you know, multiple fronts across the continuum of care with which we're working. So we put a whole lot of attention. And members of the, the commission may have heard about some of our crisis and diversionary work in particular with mobile crisis response teams. Um, and crisis stabilization uh, units, for example, those have been areas of very active work in, in Oceanside and, and kind of the North Coastal region in particular. Um, and you see those reflected uh, uh, on this map in addition to the, the blue flags, which represent um, some of our, our uh, inpatient psychiatric care efforts, again, regionally distributed across the county. The story around this service in North County, I think, is a, um, is it a particularly uh, telling and also, frankly, somewhat elegant one, reflecting our efforts to invert uh, the, the triangles with which I uh, began this presentation. In 2018, we actually had 40 inpatient psych beds uh, in North County. We had 18 crisis stabilization unit recliners, that crisis stabilization units are, are uh, by regulation not an inpatient service, they're sort of like an emergency department service, so technically ambulatory, and so we refer to recliners instead of beds as kind of units of care in those services. We had sort of a, you know, kind of a typical distribution um, of those resources in 2018, 40 inpatient beds, 18, um, uh, crisis stabilization unit recliners, and a, a, a lot of those uh, were actually situated at Tri-City Medical Center. Um, owing to changes in, the, in how psychiatric services are regulated that are, you know, kind of put in action by an entity called the Joint Commission, Tri-City suspended those services. They suspended their inpatient service and they suspended that crisis stabilization unit. Not long thereafter, Palomar Health um, because of a, a change in ownership of the building in which their downtown campus, including their behavioral health unit, was located, shuttered their inpatient service. And we went down by 20, 20 to zero inpatient beds in North County, which is a profound disservice to North County, a profound disservice to people who need psychiatric care uh, in this community. If it's important 
for people to be getting care in their communities relatively close to where their natural sources of support are. Um, that, that scenario, what we faced in 2020, really reflects compromise to the health and well-being of folks living uh, in this area. So, so we have really prioritized uh, work in, in North County because of, uh, you know, because of that rapid and dramatic diminishment uh, in, in service capacity. And we've done it in a way that really reflects what we know best from lots of research that's, that's done in this area will help us shift that pyramid again. So we've sort of inverted the proportions you can see in this slide, right? We've, we have really made a commitment to crisis stabilization uh, uh, services as a kind of top line priority because we know that, that lots of inpatient care can be uh, diverted entirely with that service. Um, we know that people who would only spend a day or two in an inpatient unit and therefore really don't need it can have their problems addressed without that more expensive service in a crisis stabilization unit connected to ongoing care, et cetera, et cetera, with sort of like, you know, with, with best outcomes for them, frankly, um, and also in a way that's most cost effective and best for communities. So we've established these you know, community based crisis stabilization unit in Oceanside and the, in the county's uh, Live Well Health Center. We have another one in uh, another community based in Vista. We've got a 16 bed. A crisis stabilization unit that's connected to the hospital at uh, Palmar Health and Escanillas. We've got 40 rec recliners at this point. And then what we're proposing as a complement to that, a, a, a desperately needed complement to that, is the reestablishment of some acute inpatient psychiatric service in North County. And that would be this 16 bed uh, uh, psychiatric health facility um, that we are partnering with, uh, with Tri City uh, Medical Center to develop. So a, a psychiatric health facility is a, um, it's a sort of peculiar category of service. It is, in, in fact, peculiar to California. It's a, it's a species of uh, inpatient psych service that's, um, uh, that was established in, in California. It is acute psychiatric care. It's a locked service, and that is a, port, uh, a point that, it was really in, that you heard uh, Mr. Light Nightingale already make, been really important in our engagement with the community to understand that. This is not a service that people walk up to. Um, this is a service that everyone who receives it will, will be transported there by some or another medical service. A lot of people who will wind up uh, at the, uh, in the psychiatric health facility will be transported there from crisis stabilization units if they need to be, if they're, you know, the level of acuity um, uh, needs to be responded to and they need a sort of higher level of care or they'll be transported from an emergency department. But there will be no sort of, you know, organic uh, human traffic like we would associate with, um, with an out, outpatient um, service. This is, of course, located in a quiet uh, uh, area away from the, the main hospital, um, uh, again, locked with uh, full-time um, security. And again, just to, to emphasize the point, uh, patients are transferred there. They are not walking up. Um, they, they will stay there for between five and seven days. That's kind of a typical length of stay for folks in, a, in an acute inpatient service. Um, and as they don't just walk up, they will also not just walk out. Um, it, is a, it is a critical component of this work um, that discharge planning begins with admission. And so everyone who leaves the facility will leave with an ongoing care plan. Uh, and, and every um, uh, kind of necessary um, effort will be made to make sure that folks are transported onto the next uh, level of, of care um, from the psychiatric health facility. Um, the work that happens there, again, is sort of, you know, kind of typical combinations of psychopharmacology, so medication, which is an important part of this kind of service, but also behavioral uh, therapeutic work. Um, the space has been designed very much with that in mind. It's a very therapeutic space. It, it is sort of beautiful to, uh, to behold. We think that's an important part of the story that it tells, actually, um, that in order to treat people with these conditions well, we need an infrastructure um, uh, that is uh, that is sort of up to the up to the job, um, 
And we need an infrastructure that reflects the fact that we value um, people with behavioral health conditions and that we uh, place importance uh, in their, their getting better. Um, we aim to have this service operational in late 2023. Um, so hoping things can, uh, can keep moving along. Um, as Mr. Nightingale noted, we've already been engaged in a bunch of uh, kind of outreach activity, a lot of direct mailing, a couple of public uh, uh, meetings at which we, we found pretty robust uh, uh, attendance and I would say proportionately active engagement, so lots of questions um, and, and responses both delivered in, in live time. I can attest to that as a participant. Um, and also uh, offered uh, in writing. We've, we've, we've uh, established a website uh, that includes an FAQ uh, and that sort of thing so people can learn about the project uh, there. And then in collaboration uh, with Tri-City Medical Center and Aaron Bisek, um, who's right behind me at this moment, um, uh, who leads intergovernmental work uh, at the, the hospital, um, has been very active uh, in, in that body of work as well. Um, this, this also reflects a deep partnership with lots of entities. So you see lots of chambers of commerce um, from municipalities across uh, North County, in addition, uh, of course, to the National Alliance of Mental Illness um, and, uh, and that sort of entity, which has been um, really important uh, to this work. Um, that's all I'm going to say, uh, uh, pending any questions from you all, though I do want to note that I am, I am joined today by not all of the people on this list, um, but by some, uh, some key parties, in, including um, Mr. Bizak, who again sits right behind me, um, and um, uh, from the county team, in particular Dave Dobson, who's project manager in the Department of General Services, and Steve Schmidt. Uh, who is the deputy director uh, also in uh, DGS. And, and so we are, we are available to answer any questions, or I could just keep blathering on forever, bro. <laughs> Thank you for that presentation. Very interesting. Um, looks like we have one question. Uh, Commissioner Bama, followed by Commissioner Morsi. Go ahead. Well, very, very interesting. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was great. It really helped. Uh, it just really helped me think about everything you guys are doing, and it's fantastic. So thank you for all your work. I was just kind of looking at the 16 beds, and like I know I saw your pyramid that went the other way. Is 16 um, optimum? I mean, optimal as far as like what you think that all we need is that? I mean, is there planning for future growth in this building as far as structurally and, and how it might spread out? I mean, it seems like it's a, it's a use that... You know, I'm glad we're going this way, but it might have to expand yeah. possibly. I mean, I don't know. What are you thinking for that? We would not anticipate expanding at this building. Okay. Um, there is a, a provision um, uh, that is um, maintained by CMS. It was actually written into Medicaid law many, many, many decades ago. Um, and it's called the Institutes for Mental Disease Provision um, that prohibits the collection. Bear with me here. It prohibits the collection of public insurance revenue at build at psychiatric services that are greater than 16 beds. In, unless, those, in, in, unless those sit within a general acute care hospital that, that where there is greater than 50% than of all beds that serve med surge instead of psychiatry. So sorry for those, those details. But that's very strong sort of compulsion for us. Um, to, uh, uh, to, to maintain the service at, a, at, the, at the scale that you see here. Um, the other question was, as far as once patients are like uh, leaving, and with, which I was surprised, like you said, four to five days after they might be going through this process, they could actually go to some type of residential unit. Do you have enough of those places? I mean, it's like, and where would they be located? Yeah, no, I appreciate the question. Um, this is an area of work that we are... Um, very, very in, engaged in uh, right now, and um, there's a lot of sort of building the plane as we fly it in the in the world of behavioral health. So this is not the only body of inpatient work that we're um, working on. You sort of see that in the in the blue flags, the map uh, th that I represented, and um, what isn't represented in that map uh, are the bodies of work that are um, that we're engaged in now around long term and residential care. Um, we're adding that <laughs> to, the, to the map and uh, adding that kind of capacity, I would say thus far in a kind of catches catch can way. So one policy that we've established in the County of San Diego is that if there is a long-term bed 
in San Diego County, it will be prioritized for a resident of San Diego County. Traditionally, that hadn't been the case. So this is a move that we've made recently that's enabling us to capture more of those long-term beds so that we have capacity to transition people into long-term care where that's appropriate. Um, it's an ongoing struggle and uh, also sort of area of opportunity and, and also a, a, an area of a lot of activity with respect to state policy. Um, so it's, it's something that we'll keep working on and that maybe we'll have opportunities to return to this commission with more proposals around. Thank you for your work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Morrissey. Yeah, I just want to applaud your staff for something that's so needed and, um, and then taking more of a, a proactive stance than reactive. And I think you're absolutely on the right track. Um, you kind of addressed it, but the kind of the couple of questions I had were, you know, where do the long term, you know, go? Yeah. And then, um, are you working with any other nonprofit organizations to help? Uh, you know, there's needs that I think people have, the homeless have. They got them there in the first place, and so, yeah, you, you patch them up and get them out there. But what's, I mean, how can we help those folks? from reoccurring and, you know, churches or any other nonprofits yeah. that okay. you see that, that can help that. Yeah. So we're very actively working with lots of nonprofits. I mean, the, the department that I run, um, you might have heard, has a sizable budget. A, a great deal of its budget is devoted to partnerships with community-based organizations. So among those listed on that slide um, is Interfaith, for example, which is an organization that's very, very active uh, up in North County. Um, but we work with lots of other partners as well. Exodus is an entity that runs um, both a mobile crisis response team in this jurisdiction, uh, as well as a, um, a crisis stabilization unit. Um, so we will continue to, uh, to work through those kinds of partnerships. I think if what I hear from you, Mr. Morrissey, is a, you know, an interest in what we collectively can do, um, I would say that the, you know, a critical thing over the, uh, the long haul is to continue to um, normalize this work. It may be a word that I'm, I'm overusing, but traditionally there's, of course, a great deal of resistance in neighborhoods to, um, to being the, you know, the, the sites for this kind of work because they're associated with populations that are difficult and challenging. And that is, in fact, a very real dynamic around a lot of services. Um, those tend to be outpatient services, right? Um, so that dynamic does not pertain uh, mm -hmm. to this particular uh, service that we're describing here. Generally, that, you know, that's where we need municipal leadership and community leadership to really sort of um, marshal uh, their efforts is around, like, how do we make this work as normal as possible? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's it for the moment for questions. Um, we're going to go to our public hearing portion and invite the audience up. Uh, do any slips to speak? Yes, Chairman Rosales, we have seven. So I'm going to go ahead and read the names in order. And don't worry if you don't know where you're at, I'll double check. <laughs> uh, first up, we have Larry Berry. Second will be Helene Bell. Third, Aaron Bizak. Fourth, Shay Benton. Fifth, Tom Demory. Sixth will be Carol Clemens. And seventh, Sue Koslova. You have three minutes to speak. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. In, Zahn, into the is mic. Is still uh, teaching? Mr. Barry, could you into the mic real quick? Yeah. Is I'm your sorry. wife still teaching? Uh, my wife retired last Friday. Did you really? Oh, good for her. <laughs> One of the best teachers. All four of my kids, when I saw you, went through your, uh, was she educated them and uh, all four of them graduated from University of California, and one just graduated from medical school. Wow. Great. So Good to hear pass that. pass that on to her. She's a, one of the fabulous teachers in Oceanside. Thank you. I'll pass that on. Uh, my name is Larry Bear. I live on 3973 Brown Street. Um, a lot of the questions were answered. Um, Mr. Nightingale uh, did uh, give me a lot of information, and the, and the doc over here did uh, answer a lot of my questions there as well. Um, you know, this in the neighborhood, there's a lot of things that we were probably at this present time 
Uh, the planning staff is about the building and the structure and the facility that we're going to have there. It, it's not about some of the things that I have a problem with is, is a signage. And you're right. We don't want a, a, a psychiatric ward in our neighborhood. What, what the planning department did, and I am so grateful for them, that they eliminate the, ex, uh, the access road there, and they're going to put the, um, the fence all the way across, and they're going to be doing that. And I, uh, I think that's a great thing. I, I found out today that this is a five or seven um, day, uh, um, the term that they will be in their facility here. Um, one of the things I've done in the last two weeks, I guess, I went on social media and I asked for people to give me some information about what's happening. Mental illness is, is a, and health is a big thing right now. It's, it's crazy. Excuse the pun there, but um, what they're, you know, we're doing, and I, I got over 250 hate calls, hate mails to me. People showed up on my front door because I asked for information about this um, facility and how it's going to affect my neighborhood. And so there is a lot of consternation on people about putting in a neighborhood thing like this in close to our, our neighborhood and how we're going to hit this. Um, I got a lot of questions asked. Again, I thank Mr. Nangel. We got this, um, uh, the, the facility now is, is more enlightened to us. Our next step is when it goes to the city council. And before you leave tonight, I hope you'll tell us when you think this will go to the city council. But I want to tell you something else, that I have a good friend. I'm 70 years old. I have a, a friend of mine, Bob. He, uh, he has a 49-year-old son who's schizophrenic. And, and that's what I like that the doctor to answer to this. Um, he has put Bob's wife, she's 68 years old, in the hospital five times. Their physical violence that these, these individuals have. And he ended up, uh, he told me this last week, he went out and, and, he, the, and for the last 20 years, the schizophrenic, his son has been in jail over 20 years. His son, um, he went out and he said he can't do it. He called the sheriffs, he bought a gun, and he told the, the sheriff, San Diego, he lives in Vista, he bought a gun and he said, I'm gonna defend myself and my wife because of his son is schizophrenic and out of control. And he's been in and out of jail for the last 20 years. And what do you do with these people? Now, that, uh, for a father, how does, how does that deal? And you've probably seen this and how we deal with this. And, and I guess I'm asking, what is the level for the people that are gonna be in this facility? This isn't somebody that's dealing with, I got, you know, uh, you know I, I, I can't get out of bed in the morning because I'm depressed. Mr. Barry. Is it schizophrenic? Could I, could I get you to wrap up your, your comments? Is that it? I can talk all night. I <laughs> okay. Thank well, you. You bet, thank you. Uh, our next speaker, please. <laughs> Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Helene Bell. I'm a 30-year resident of Oceanside on Waring Road. My questions in no way discount the need for good psychiatric intervention. My questions focus on the 10 to 12 months of construction disruptions to our community. Our community would like assurance that no additional structures or stories will be added that the 14,400 square foot structure described in the hearing announcement is essentially the same structure that was discussed at the town hall meeting earlier this year and represented by the plan shared at that time. Part of the construction will include the removal of a large amount of existing soil. What is the assurance that the community will not be negatively affected by dust? The community wants a contact person who will be responsible for collecting, addressing, and mitigating any complaints that may arise during construction. Was solar installation and native plant vegetation a consideration of design for sustainability? 
I appreciate the changes made to the temp temporary construction entrance that were discussed with me before this hearing. <sighs> what is our assurance that the city council will vote to accept these changes? That concludes my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Rosales, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Aaron Bizak, and I'm here wearing several hats tonight. Uh, I'm speaking both as the Chief External Affairs Officer for Tri-City Medical Center and as a family member of a behavioral health care consumer. Uh, I was born in Tri-City Medical Center. I have lived in the three cities of the Tri-Cities my entire life. I actually came uh, to Tri-City as a member of the executive leadership team in May of 2018. 2018, and within two weeks of arriving there, uh, we were faced with the challenge of having to suspend operations of our behavioral health unit. Now, just to go a little bit further to what Dr. Luke Bergman said, um, the reason why we had to suspend operations of a unit that had been in place for decades was new changes to federal regulations about ligature risk within facilities. That is the risk of hanging. Uh, and you were no longer allowed to have a building housing and inpatient behavioral health unit that had drop ceilings, mm. tile ceilings, and our entire facility had that. Mm. So we had to make a, a decision very quickly to suspend operations of the facility to protect the, the, the health and safety of our patients and, quite honestly, the, the license of the rest of the hospital. Mm. So, you know, obviously that challenge could not be overcome at the time. We were forced to suspend operations, but we immediately entered into discussions with the County of San Diego about what the future of behavioral health looks like in our region. Uh, simultaneously, I was serving as an advocate for a sibling suffering from a decades-long ch challenge with mental illness, substance abuse, and homelessness. Uh, she had been hospitalized countless times, including at our medical center, and kept falling through the cracks of a system that, at the time, was decidedly not patient-focused and was ill-equipped to help her and countless others in similar circumstances. This confluence of professional and personal challenges was certainly difficult at the time, but I believe it was fortuitous. I felt that I was in the right place at the right time to help make a difference. Since then, much has changed. The County of San Diego has adopted a structural reform of the behavioral health system that upends and reframes historical inefficiencies in how those suffering from mental illness are cared for. Tri-City Medical Center has remained committed to providing high-level behavioral health care at both our robust outpatient behavioral health services, which has operated in VISTA for many years, and once again in an inpatient setting at this new Tri-City Psychiatric Health Facility. I'd also note that our hospital has an extensive community outreach program that we call the Coastal Commitment. It stands for Community Outreach and Support Through Active Leadership. We have nearly 90 partner organizations in our community dealing with issues of substance abuse, behavioral health, housing instability, homelessness, things of that nature, and it is really best in class. This project is a key piece of a very complex puzzle that is being built by the county in conjunction with public and private partners, including our medical center. This project, among others, will fundamentally shift the way care is delivered for the most at-risk members of our community. And for our community and behavioral health consumers like my sister, I urge your approval of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. I'm Jay Benton. Oh, yeah. So, me, my job. I'm a, a Jay Benton. I'm a, um, a consultant with Cook and Schmid, uh, director of public affairs. Um, we've been partnering, uh, we've been brought on by the county and Tri-City team to partner with them to manage all the public affairs. Um, we've met multiple of you on, on Zoom uh, and, and briefed you, and I, uh, I really appreciate that opportunity to do that um, uh, in the past and to answer questions. Um, so that's me professionally. Um, <laughs> A little more casual and in my life as a um, mental health advocate uh, and substance abuse advocate 
and homeless advocate, um, I, uh, you know, you look at me today and you look at someone who, um, who looks professional, right? Who has a job, who's here standing in front of you, articulate speaking at a, at a meeting. And, um, about three years ago in 2019, um, I, my life was at rock bottom. Um, I was, uh, I was, um, diagnosed with alcoholism. Um, I, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, got, um, uh, two DUIs. I was on the verge of homelessness, lost my job. Um, and, uh, and I had, I went to multiple, um, uh, facilities like this that were, um, uh, that, that worked for me. They, they, like I was in a facility for five to seven days in that short time period for me. And I, I have, I had, I, it's treated now, but I had, um, very, uh, you know, severe mental disorders, um, similar to what was described earlier. Um, and now I'm able to come out and, 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 and be successful. I've gotten my car back, my job back, um, my health back, my family back, my friends back. Um, and, but the best thing is that I've got my life back and I've got my friends back and, um, and I'm able to, to, to come out now and help advocate for projects like this as part of my job it was incredibly rewarding. And so I would just, uh, um, from a personal note and a professional note, um, uh, advise approval. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Next, we have Tom Demori. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Commissioner, how are you today? My name is Tom Demori. I live at 3306 Heather Lane. My backyard backs up to the new health care facility. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the location. I think you could have put it somewhere else, but you know it's there, and I'm very happy that they're going to eliminate the driveway and the pedestrian walkway. Where would they put a driveway there with a gate and never open it for 10, 20, 30 years unless there's going to be a fire? But I'm re really happy that they're going to eliminate it. And I like the question uh, Mr. Dobbs asked about the landscaping. It's going to be all looking good. And what occurred to me all of a sudden is that they're going to have a six-foot fence. I'm 6'2", so anybody can jump over me. You know, maybe you can consider an eight-foot fence for that property. Anybody can jump over me, and I'm 6'2". So I just want to say a thank you, uh, uh, Scott, for giving me a call regarding uh, the elimination of the driveway and the fence. I do appreciate it. All we want to do in our neighborhood that we live in is keep our neighborhood safe, clean, and uh, just live there with our you know kids and our family. And uh, so they're putting this facility here, which is a good thing, but it needs to be looked at a little bit more closely. Maybe an eight-foot fence, no gate, no pedestrian gate as well. So what else do I have? Uh, that's about it. I do appreciate it, and uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Carol Clemens. You have three minutes to speak. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Carol Clemens. I'm the mother of a mentally ill man. I'm here in support of the Tri City Health Facility. I have what's called a lived experience with behavioral health systems in North County. In 2018, when my 25-year-old son began showing signs of mental illness, our family had no idea what to think of his troubling behaviors. We tried tough love. We tried family counseling, who sent us to a psychiatrist. We ended up paying $250 cash to a psychiatrist 
for a 50-minute session with our son. The doctor handed us a pill of sample medications and sent us out the door without referrals, recommendations, or follow-up appointments. My sister told me about NAMI, the National Alliance of Mental Illness. NAMI offers family support groups. In those weekly meetings, that's where I learned about the services available and the huge gaps in care with those people living with brain disorders. In my son's case, he lacks insight to his disease, which exacer exasperates his condition. He repeatedly states he does not need our help, and he is not sick. This part of his relapsing disease is known as anosognosia. This is where the PERT emergency response, psychiatric emergency response team comes into play. We had no choice but to engage emergency services for a crisis that really wasn't happening. It was an acute situation, but we had to engage emergency services. So we planned a 5150 hold as best we could. The PERT team came twice to our home and my son presented well and off they went. They told me to cut the apron strings. Finally, the third attempt at PERT was successful and they asked us what hospital to take him to. We then chose the downtown psychiatric hospital that had terrible reviews by my other NAMI mom friends, or, or Aurora Private Psychiatric Hospital in Rancho Bernardo. So we chose Aurora. They came to our home on a planned date and time, and they handcuffed our son it was completely calm and cooperative at the time and pleasant. They took him to Aurora. This single heartbreaking event was actually what changed and turned him around a little bit. After day four or five thousand dollars a day we were paying, he started to show some progress. Then they discharged him again without any follow-up care or services. My point is that he didn't need emergency services. We weren't in crisis. We just needed something like what you're proposing here. So. I'm encouraging you to support this process. And on another note, I was an auxiliary volunteer at Tri-City for 17 years. I brought my dogs there, mostly to oncology, and then I went to the psychiatric ward that's been there for many, many, many years in that same neighborhood, right by those fences, and there was never any disruption inside or outside that psychiatric facility. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm also speaking for my friend Sue, who couldn't be here tonight. Okay. Good evening, Sue Koslava and her family. They are longtime residents of San Marcos. I am speaking in strong support of the construction of the psychiatric health facility. North County San Diego is in desperate need of this new 16-bed facility. Within the past several years, both the previous Tri-City Psychiatric Facility and the old Palomar Hospital Psychiatric Facility were closed. This left North County with no psychiatric beds. I am the mother of a 33-year-old son with severe mental illness that began when he was 19. It took us over nine years to get our son stabilized due to lack of psychiatric beds and follow-up care. He was taken in on at least seven 5150 psychiatric holds, only to be released before he was truly medically stabilized on new medications. He would then relapse by ceasing to take these medications. Then we would have to wait again until he was a danger to himself or others or presented as gravely disabled prior to starting over with another 5150 hold. Had this new Tri-City Psychiatric Health Facility existed, he would have been moved from 5150 hold to this proposed facility where he would remain stabilized for five to seven days while his long-term psychiatric facility would be lined up. This would have saved him years of instability and presented, prevented our son from being caught in the revolving door in the psychiatric continuum of care in San Diego County. The proposed facility will play in an integral role in addressing the current mental health crisis. It'll provide those experience, experiencing acute mental illness with additional treatment options in North County that specifically fit their needs. We have had 
plenty of experience over the 14 years having to drive to Rancho Bernardo, Claremont Mesa, and even out to Alpine to visit our son when he was held in a long-term psychiatric facility. We have never been aware of loud noises emitting from any of those locked facilities, so this should not be a worry to those living near the Tri-City facility. Expanded mental health treatment is critical for the people in North County, and I fully support the addition of the Tri-City Psychiatric Health Facility. Thank you. Thank you. How many more speakers? That's it? That concludes them. Great, the thank you. So we'll close the public hearing. Um, I heard a couple of comments or, and or questions. Um, I'll start with one. Scott, in um, this attachment with our staff report, there's, a, I think it's a permit that the applicant has filled out. There's some Q&A information towards the end. Uh, looks, yeah, it's a summary of the community engagement that uh, the applicant did in uh, May. There's a question, or there's, a, there's an answer to a question about the fencing that it's supposed to be a, uh, it's proposed to be an eight foot high steel tube fence. Can you clarify, because it does seem to me that the six foot standard that you refer to maybe is a bit on the short side. Uh, can you clarify, is it gonna be eight or, or six foot? Yeah, it's, it's, only, it's proposed for eight. That's the standard for the zoning ordinance. For article 30, Fences and walls, I just looked it up. The only way you can have a residential, uh, eight foot high fence if it's a budding residential and has to be a solid masonry wall. Uh, unfortunately, this is a, a broad, black wrought iron wall uh, fence, so it doesn't meet that requirement. So okay. if we wanted to change that, I mean, what do we have to do? If they want to change that, they can. They, can. they, don't, they just come to the planning department. They can get a building permit for just the wall. They don't have to come out to planning commission. For a wall, not, yeah. not an eight foot uh, yeah. wrought iron? Has to be a wall. Has to be a wall. It's, it's, you, you're seeing that more. There's something that state's doing with a program called Home Key, where the state's buying hotels, and part of the county uh, requirement is is an eight foot fence around the property. And so I don't know. And then I heard on top of that that people are cutting through. So maybe we're not wor worried about the people in the inside getting out, but the outside cutting through. So I, I would be. I would like to, you know, investigate doing an eight-foot fence. Uh, Commissioner Morrissey, we can look into that and work yeah. with the applicant on that. Okay. So maybe we can pick that up in our uh, sure. motion. The other thing I heard, um, there, there was some commentary about the construction activity that might impact uh, the surrounding neighborhood. And I think the, there was a, quest for a request for a point of contact. I imagine that the contractor um, and or the applicant could make that available, um, you know, that there's sort of a central place where people could ask a question or provide some input or get an answer to something that's impacting it from the construction aspect. Exactly. Once they submit their building permit or their grade and or grading permit, um, there's going to be an engineer inspector and building inspector that'll be assigned to the project. So Perfect. typically they would be the point of contact. Uh, my, they can always call me and I can reference them to whoever the inspector is. So I don't mind having them reach out to me. They can Great. do that as well. Thank you. And then perhaps a question for Dr. Bergman, if you wouldn't mind coming to the dais. Um, I don't know if you can answer this question, but it's, it's a good question about the sort of types of uh, clients that would be seen at this facility. I imagine, quite frankly, it might be of a wide variety, but if you could maybe characterize it to some degree. Sure, so um, we would anticipate seeing people um, whom we would designate as seriously mentally ill at this facility. Um, so some of those folks may have co-occurring substance use disorder conditions, but that wouldn't be a primary um, diagnosis. The primary diagnosis would be one of a number that fit into um, the, the sort of broader designation of serious mental illness. That includes schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, major depressive disorder, uh, those kinds of things. So combination, it could be either a, right. you know, a psychotic spectrum disorder or a mood disorder. Great, thank you. Any questions uh, either for Dr. Bergman or staff? Thank you, sir. 
Um, okay. Um, can I make a motion? You certainly can, so Vice Chair Morrissey. I recommend that we follow staff's recommendation and confirm issuance of the CEQA guidelines, Article 19, Section 15332. We approve the development plan D21-4 and CUP-21-2 by adopting the Planning Commission Resolution Number 2022-P14 with findings and conditions of approval attached herein, and then how do we want to address the eight-foot fence? If you want to articulate that staff, maybe look into it, or, or more assertively, if you want to say we, we would like. We would like an eight-foot fence there. Okay. Well, uh, as, as proposed in the presentation, also we have a, a condition that we'd like to add, a removal of the driveway. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Okay. We can add Thank that as well, that. just one condition that we'd work with the, the applicant on incorporating an eight-foot uh, fence or wall okay. uh, that abuts residential, and then, uh, or and or maybe landscaping on the Warring Road side. Uh, we, we'll have to talk with the police department to see if they need if they really need that transparent on that section. Um, and if that's the case, maybe we can just have landscaping. But definitely on the residential portion that abuts um, this this property, um, we can work with them on in incorporating okay. some type of wall that's eight feet. So, all okay. that. <laughs> So, uh, I, so I think we, we heard the driveway that's that's going away, um, and it'll include landscape that's characteristic of the rest of the development, and then um, that you would work with the applicant and or OPD to to look at opportunities for increasing the the fencing to eight foot and perhaps a masonry wall uh, to the degree that's reasonable, uh, and you'd have that interaction with the develop or the uh, applicant to right. see if that's possible. That's, that's great. Like capture it. Okay. Any other comments or questions or? Sir, we've closed the public hearing. Uh, if I could for a moment, uh, Mr. Chair, my name is Steve Schmidt. I'm a deputy director with TGS with the uh, County of San Diego, and I, I just want to clarify on something that I think I heard before talking about an application for a building permit with the City of Oceanside. Is that what I've heard being discussed before? Uh, yes, for a grading permit and a building permit. Are okay. you are you? So so we have already sent a letter to the city of Oceanside that the county of San Diego will be the AHJ on uh, grading and construction. Um, however, on these issues of fences and things like that, we certainly would like to work with staff and uh, and satisfy your concerns and uh, construct fences according to your wishes. However, that would work within your your uh, organization. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion made by Vice Chair Morrissey that included a couple of items that we've articulated a couple of times to staff. Uh, any further discussion, or would somebody like to make a, a second on that motion? It would be my honor to make the second. Great, thank you. We have a, a motion, Vice Chair Morrissey, a second by Commissioner Dodds. Any further discussion? I'd just like to say uh, thank you for the presentation, very informative. Uh, clearly this uh, facility is needed for a number of reasons and I think you've been very open to uh, community input and then uh, the idea that maybe we build a couple of either other elements into this uh, approval process. This would go forward to the as a recommendation to the City Council next and it would be staff to, to uh, schedule that. So we have a motion to second. Let's um, vote. Staff, did you have a question you wanted or a comment you made before we vote? Uh, Chairman Rosales, I just wanted to clarify. Tonight, the uh, Planning Commission can serve as the final acting authority on this okay. uh, project unless it gets appealed to City Council for one reason or another. Okay, so this, this body is approving this this evening and it will not go to the City Council for final approval unless it's appealed. Great, thank you for that clarification. Let's go ahead and vote. Let the record show that the motion passes 5-0. Great, thank you. And thank you everybody for your input this evening. Okay, that will conclude tonight's uh, public hearing items. Again, item six is being continued, uh, the Ocean Cam is being continued until July 25th. For your input, if you could uh, 
take your conversations outside. Thank you. Thank you. Um, appeal of city planners determination. We don't have anything on tonight's agenda or discussion items either. So we will go to uh, city planner and commissioner reports. Um, I don't really don't really have anything this evening other than a question for a city planner. Um, vacancy on this commission. Any uh, input or information on when that might be filled? Chairman Rosales, we're waiting on feedback from the city manager's office on when a potential um, workshop date could be held. Um, given the July recess coming up, um, I'm not sure that there's opportunity to do it before then. So it may be not. It might not be until August or September until we see uh, a workshop scheduled by the city clerk's office. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, I'll be. Um, do, do we have another planning commission meeting this month? Planned? There is one scheduled, uh, Chairman Rosales, there is one scheduled for the 27th of twenty seven. Okay, I thought I saw that. Um, I'll be absent that evening, uh, but I'm sure Vice Chair Morrissey will fill in just very nicely for me. So. Uh, That'll be a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Tom. Thank you. <laughs> um, that's all I have uh, for me. Vice Chair Morrissey, any updates or reports? No update. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Obama. Uh, nothing to report. Thank you. Uh, we don't have Commissioner Custer tonight. Commissioner Dodds? Nothing to report. And Commissioner Simons? To report. Thanks. Great. City Planner, we'll turn over the last bit of the meeting to you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rosales. Uh, just to give you an update on a couple upcoming items uh, to the Planning Commission. On the meeting of the June 27th, we have scheduled a CUP to convert uh, the Marty, Marty's Valley Inn on Mission Avenue to an SRO hotel. It's mm. been in process for quite some time. It's been serving as a de facto um, SRO currently, so it's coming to formalize that um, use there. Um, on the meeting of uh, July 11th, we have scheduled a, a zoning text amendment to update our current our local density bonus ordinance. It's uh, it's been three years since we updated it, and a number of uh, legislative cycles have passed, which uh, have updated um, uh, density bonus law. So ours is cert uh, currently out of date and it's not consistent with state law, so we need to make it consistent with state law. Um, also at that meeting uh, is scheduled tentatively uh, a project known as Tierra Norte. It's a general plan amendment, zone amendment, um, plan block development uh, to just change, no physical developments proposed, it's just to change the land use and zoning on a 25 acre combined parcel on the south side of North River Road, uh, east of Douglas Drive. It's been in process since 2013. Yeah, long time. Long time. Uh, at the meeting on um, July 25th, we have scheduled a new single family residence within uh, the St. Mala community, and the Ocean Camp project should be um, ready for consideration that evening. And then moving on to City Council at the meeting on June 22nd, again, we have the two appeals of the Whaley Street project and the Cypress Point uh, residential project. And moving out to August 10th, we have a climate action plan progress report um, going to City Council. Uh, the same GPU alternatives you saw recently will be going to City Council and the aforementioned density bonus ordinance update and an update to home occupation that you considered in March will also be going to City Council at that time. Um, uh, coming up on July 13th, there is going to be a community forum hosted at the El Corazon Senior Center uh, to um, discuss farmland conservation uh, techniques uh, to, in the effort to preserve farmland um, and farming out in South Moore Hills. This is in the context of we have a climate action plan implementation uh, measure that we have to satisfy, and this is an effort to um, put 50 acres of uh, farmland in South Moore Hills under conservation easement. Hmm. And finally, today we distributed an email with an opportunity this Friday for a planning commissioner um, seminar hosted by the um, uh, by the Institute for Local Government. So, if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out for me. Sorry about the late notice, but we only became aware of it ourselves recently. It's a good opportunity, especially for the new planning commissioners, to get a good taste of an overview of what the uh, planning commission is responsible for. Well, that concludes my report. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sending out that that meeting. You, you know, so the new commissioners, if 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 you have time on Friday, uh, that would be probably a good place to get some input. I think you should. Twenty years. Too stale. 
It's all day. Okay. It's all day. Yeah, it looks like it's about nine to four um, in the afternoon. Nine in the morning to four in the afternoon. We're adjourned. Thank you.